your announcements. Walk with Christ and be baptized. Sign up on a connection card or at thewayberkeley.com slash connect. Be prepared to attend the baptism class, which happens on the day you're baptized. We commit to helping you grow as a Christian. Sign up for the available live groups at thewayberkeley.com slash grow. Get a free session with a licensed clinician by signing up at thewayberkeley.com. Join your friends who have expanded their service to our community. You can serve for a term on one of our ministry teams. Sign up at thewayberkeley.com slash grow in order to serve. What are the ways in which we create a space of hope in really difficult situations? How do we create opportunities for young people who live in situations that are really treacherous? Join us in this discussion of healing and urban education. Come to the final session of our Hope and Healing Summer Series of Books and Breakfast. Sean Genwright will share the findings from his recent book. Books and Breakfast is Saturday, August 26th from 10 a.m. to noon. Take the journey with Brittany Richardson as she tells the story of a woman who suffers childhood sexual abuse, finds healing and community through the arts, and moves to Africa to use the arts to bring healing to other exploited young girls. Art and Abolition is on Thursday, August 31st at 8 p.m. You can access these updates and more at thewayberkeley.com. Enjoy your week. Today we're going to start uh, this uh, series on foundations by going to uh, the gospel of, or not the gospel, the epistle letter of 1 Peter. So why don't you turn with us to 1 Peter, amen, and let's see what the word of the Lord says to us. I uh, ask you to keep us in prayer. Uh, my family, all of us are heading out of town in, I don't know, a few hours sometime. We're heading to New York. Uh, many of you know that we lead or I lead a national campaign of faith congregations to help us uh, organize ourselves to address the issues of gun violence and mass incarceration. And so we're launching a concert series to help us uh, spread the word in about eight to 10 of the most violent and incarcerated cities in the country. And uh, we're using it to organize the church to uh, be prepared to respond. And uh, so some of our friends, uh, Erica Campbell and Tina Campbell, Mary Mary and and, uh, uh, Lecrae and and uh, 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 some old school R&B hip hop folks, Arrested Development, and 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 uh, uh, who else? Because I don't listen to these folks. And then, uh, but it's people you would know, praise God. And so uh, uh, we we gonna have Fred Hammond, touch your neighbor, y'all know Fred Hammond, Amen. Uh, we gonna have a good time. So we're launching it in New York and Brooklyn on uh, today, Sunday, tomorrow, and then uh, we'll be kind of going across the country. Some of them will be streamed, and so hopefully you'll get a chance to tune in. I don't think we're going to bring one to Oakland because our work is so saturated here in Oakland. Uh, But we do want to uh, make sure that we can take this message and this work to other parts of the country. And so I'm asking you to please please pray with us as uh, we get a chance to go and hang out and do some of that work. And um, and then on my way back, uh, this is the third year anniversary of the killing and the murder of Michael Brown and the Ferguson Uprising. So... My brother, Pastor Ben, is taking a delegation of folks to Ferguson, and I'll be meeting up with them, amen, uh, later on this week. And uh, you'll be surprised how very little has changed in the last several years. Uh, We have more more killings and and, and incidents of brutality and injustice. And so our work is just beginning. It's not ending. Um, And certainly, I hope and pray who we are as the church begins to continue, not begins, but continues to form how we respond to uh, the worst conditions, both in our soul and our body. Amen? All right, so 1 Peter chapter number 2 is where we're heading. Uh, 1 Peter is a letter that is often ascribed to uh, Peter, the apostle, who denied Jesus three times. And uh, I love, you know, you do a little background on some of these these books. You you, you just got to appreciate that the people who were included in the scriptures as authors or attributed authors or people who, uh, whose eyewitness testimony helped to round out our faith, 
were not perfect people by any stretch of the imagination. And I know for all you perfect folk, that don't mean much to you. Thank God for you, amen, and your self-perception, amen. But for the rest of us who are woke, praise God, amen, who know that we, you know, a little piece of work, tell your neighbor you a piece of work, it's all right. God's working on you, amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. He is, God's working on you. For all of us who know that we, we, we a little, we a little, we a little, you know, broke down and, and in need of a savior, it's great to know that everyone that God used in scripture had a flaw. And, and so Peter is one of these, you know, he, he's a, he one of these bold guys, you know, who, who acts without thinking, you know, who talks without thinking, you know, who be cussing people out and then feel bad about it later, who be hitting folk and then feel bad. You know, you met that kind of folk, right? Uh -huh. It's like your temper just gets the best of you. And you don't be telling people you feel bad till you get by yourself and then you just be like, man. Said I wasn't going to do that again. Mm. But the great thing about Peter is that Peter messed up so many times. Seemed like Jesus just like, well, that's just Pete. You know, he's, he's a mess. And so 1 Peter is one of these interesting letters that is often attributed to him. Some think he had a comrade, a deacon, an elder named Sylvanus who may have uh, 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 contributed or, 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 or sent this letter out on behalf of Peter to the church in Rome. Either way, it's an authoritative uh, letter to the church to help them understand how you are to live in an environment that is anti-God, anti-Christ, or at the very least, not familiar with anything you're talking about. And I thought this would be an important passage to kind of ground our foundations in because for many of us, uh, I, if you're honest, I, I'm certainly, if you follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you, you, you hear and can see some of my strong feelings about the church in America. That I think uh, the church in America is, is somewhat lost and confused about who we are and what we are supposed to be doing. And so uh, sometimes you just got to remind yourself. And, you know, it's okay that you're lost. You just got to want to be found. You see? And you ever been riding around in a car with somebody and you just know that this is not the right direction? You're sitting there like, okay, now I've seen this 7-Eleven at least four times. You try to give them some advice, and, you know, they just, no, 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 I know where I'm going. I'm just taking the scenic route. And it's, 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 even the GPS is starting to, like, are you listening to anything I'm saying? <laughs> Rerouting, GPS just says, all right, I'm done. Just figure it out on your own. And, and it's, 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 it's important that if you're lost, you got to want to be found. And sometimes uh, I worry that. We are so lost, and we are so arrogant in our lostness. Is that a word? Lostness? Or lockness? Lostness? That's a word? That you and I have to want to be found. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I want to be found today. I want to be found. And so let's take a look then at what this text may offer to you and I as the key to some foundations so we don't forget who we are. First Peter chapter number 2, verse 4. The letter is, again, being written to the church in Rome who is, uh, indeed, trying to figure out how do we live under the maniacal reign of this crazy emperor. Make any connections you want. Amen. Verse number four, welcome to the living stone, the source of life. The workman took one look and threw it out. But God set it in the place of honor. So present yourselves as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary vibrant with life in which you will serve. Oh, that's interesting. 
in which you will serve mm, as holy priests, offering Christ-approved lives up to God. Wow, so today all you have been ordained a priest. Amen. Uh, keep reading. The scriptures provide precedent. Look, I'm setting a stone in Zion, a cornerstone in the place of honor. Whoever trusts in this stone as a foundation will never have cause to regret it. To you who trust him, he's a stone to be proud of. But to those who refuse to trust him, the stone the workmen threw out is now the chief foundation stone. For the untrusting, ooh, this is interesting, it's a stone to trip over. Tell your neighbor, stop tripping, amen. Uh, that's another good title. You know, when I be reading the scriptures, like, I, you know, five, six times in is when I really feel like, man, I could preach this thing. So I'm only on the fourth, fourth read, amen. They trip and fall because they refuse to obey, just as predicted. Uh, here's the good news, verse number nine. But you are the ones chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do God's work and speak out for God. And tell others of the night and day difference God made for you. From nothing to something. From rejected to accepted. All right, I ain't going to have to do too much work on this passage, amen. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk about foundations again. Don't forget who you are. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing. That makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Uh, the foundation of our faith we must never forget or waver on is Jesus. And it's so interesting because there's a lot of folk who claim to follow Jesus but are doing a lot of things opposite of what Jesus said for us to do. Now, it's so fascinating, again, when we think of the history of Christian faith and the theological uh, formation and trajectory of Christian faith. This is a, at least a 2,000-year conversation uh, of, 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 of the life of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. And if you add uh, the work of the, the, the people and the children of Israel who gave birth to Jesus, we then now, at least in about a 4,000 uh, uh, year long conversation, uh, that we have textual kind of uh, 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 material to dive into. And then if you take seriously that, that the revelation of God to the children of Israel, to the people of Israel, uh, is all the way back to the beginning, then we got some millions of years worth of conversation about God that should deeply inform who we are and the God we serve. And yet, if you were to look around at those who claim to follow Jesus in 2017, in the United States of America. You would have to scratch your head and wonder, which Jesus are you following? Because there are all kind of folk who claim Jesus, but I want to know, does Jesus claim you? Now, lest you think I'm being unreasonable, 
There is some passages where Jesus says there are going to be some folk who claim that they were doing the work of Jesus. Casting out demons. Healing the sick. Doing all these works. And you're going to stand before the throne and you're going to be going through the little, little book. Kind of like some of y'all to be looking for your reservation. You ever went to a hotel after traveling all night, all day? You know you got a hotel room, and they can't find your reservation. And, you know, it's a humbling thing when you're not in the role. Jesus said, some folk going to be standing there. Hmm. I don't know who you are. It's just, I don't know. No, Jesus, look what I did. You see my collar? You see my denomination? You see my color? You see my worship? You see it? And some, I'm not, no, I don't know who it's going to be. I hope I'm not one of them people. You stand for Jesus McBride. I don't know what you, I don't know. Mm -mm. I know your name, but you're not in this book. There's something risky about claiming to follow Jesus, but doing the opposite of what Jesus says. I mean, why would you want to claim to be a follower of someone you don't follow? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I don't know. Why did I just say I don't follow Jesus, I follow the Constitution? Or I follow my PhD, or I follow my paycheck. How many know that you don't get to like, you know, put Jesus on top or wrap Jesus in like Jesus is the wrap, you know, the, 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 the gift wrap. But there is something that is more foundational to that which you're wrapping up, that is not Jesus. And I want you to appreciate and hear it the way our foundation is Jesus. It is. It is. And, you know, I, 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 I know some of us, this ain't the kind of Jesus we used to maybe hearing about that much because, you know, a lot of us have been shaped and formed in the Western kind of capitalistic American church that loves oppression and idolatry and violence and domination and imperialism and have made Jesus the champion of that. And so now when you start to hear Jesus the liberator, you're like, that's not Jesus. It's like, wait a second. When Jesus was here, Jesus wasn't dominating too many folk. Thank God for those three claps, amen. And somehow we just, it's hard for us, amen. Even the disciples, when Jesus was walking around, they was trying to make Jesus do stuff Jesus wasn't there to do. Jesus, when you going to overthrow this Roman Empire now? I'm tired of this thing, man. When you going to fool these centurions, these police centurions persecuting us? Well, you know, even the disciples had a sense of like, Jesus, we waiting on you to do something. Jesus, Jesus said, I, I'm going I'm to overthrow some stuff. Have no fear. But it ain't going to be no pick and choosing of who gets overthrown. This whole thing is getting turned upside down. Even me. And even you. But there is none of us who escape the upside down gospel that Jesus is bringing to the world. Now let's be clear. There are some folk who want to follow Jesus and leave things just the way they are. Then there's some folk who want to follow Jesus and act like you are God. And we act the way we're going to follow Jesus and just be faithful. Because I believe in our faithfulness, there is something subversive about the faithful follower of Jesus, that if you love folk well, if you serve folk well, if you help 
folk, and if you stand in the gap for folk, and if you speak out for those who can't speak for themselves, and if you do what Jesus ultimately did and sacrificially give the very most precious thing that you have so others may have the chance to experience salvation, you will turn the world upside down. So let's take a look then at what the scriptures kind of give to us as what I think are some, some clues for how you and I ought to secure our foundation. And it's so important uh, because uh, there is, I, 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 I got this little reflection I wrote, that there is a false gospel sweeping the land. One characterized by exclusion, exploitation, and violence. Such a foundation is unable to hold the weight of our human complexity and sin. We must reject this insufficient foundation and build on the stone that the builders have rejected, Jesus the crucified and risen Christ. And it's so important to keep naming that the Jesus we serve is crucified and risen. Because the crucifixion of Jesus demonstrates that the follower of Jesus, the faithful follower of Jesus, will suffer persecution for doing the right thing. God saved me from a gospel that wants to keep me comfortable, particularly in the face of the wrong thing. Whew. It's going to be tough up in here today. I can already tell. How many of you know that there's, 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 there, there's a lot of, you know, when you get used to a certain way of life, you can get comfortable. And, 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 and anything that disrupts your comfort becomes your enemy. Even if the comfort is not good for you. So Jesus, you know, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, as the scripture says, the one who was there at the beginning and who be there at the end, the first and the last, Alpha and Omega, this Jesus, the one who was the uncreated one who humbled himself, took on the form of flesh. How many know if you are the creator of everything, and then you bound yourself up in that which you created. You kind of have become a pretty uncomfortable, you're in a pretty uncomfortable place. And that uncomfortability eventually led to the death of the one who was there at the beginning of everything. So if Jesus did not escape the cross, why would the follower of Jesus think they could escape the cross? I mean, we got to keep talking about the crucifixion, y'all. Man, I know we wear it around our neck like a fashion statement, blingity-blinging the cross. But how many of you know that that cross is a sign of suffering and shame? That'd be like you walking around with an execution chamber on your neck today. Woo! <laughs> execution chamber. Amen. <laughs> but the power of who Jesus is and was, the faithfulness, the depth of Jesus' faithfulness, listen, redeemed the symbol of death of the empire. And made it a source of people's hope. When Jesus was on the cross, the, Romans, the Roman centurion who was there presiding over the death. Watched how Jesus suffered on that cross. And said, there has never been a man like this. Now, I don't know if that centurion or that Roman soldier was like, you know, stalking Jesus for them three, four years of his ministry. He just came to a conclusion, 
or if he was so moved by the way Jesus endured suffering that in 12 hours he went from a non-believer to a believer. I'm just here to tell you today, I know we trying to stay comfortable, but could it be? Lord, help me. I don't know what I'm up here talking about. That my discomfort for a season can be some evidence to help turn someone's heart back to God. How you go through? I'm not telling you. I mean, I don't think we serve a masochist. God's just trying to put us through all this kind of suffering. But I say it all the time. I think uh, Chester, Chesterton says that 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 Christianity has not been uh, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting, but has been found too hard and not tried at all. That there ain't no easy way to go to heaven or hell. Touch your neighbor. You're going to struggle going to either place. So if you're going to struggle, give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I'd rather struggle going to heaven. Amen. Why struggle going all the way to hell? Unless you don't believe in heaven or hell. How many know you can have heaven or hell right here on this earth? Crucifixion, but the resurrection. The risen Christ is important as well because it reminds us that trouble don't last always. And that death will never have the final say. This is the foundation of who we are. And that's why the first thing that I want you to remember and be confident about is that Jesus is your foundation. Now, it is indeed the case, child of God, that all of us have to continue to test if this is true. Because... If your foundation is not sure, everything you build upon, that will fall. May not fall today. May not fall tomorrow. May not even fall next week. We bought our house foreclosed, and they told us that the, uh, the, uh, the, the person who built the house back in 2007, 2009, you know, ran out of money. So he... he I assume it's a he, because that sounds like something he does. Amen. Shortcuts. Shortcuts. You know, just make a shortcut. He was supposed to put a brace on the house because our house is on the hill. He did put the brace on the house. So, you know, we like, who? we got us a house on the hill at half the price. Touch your neighbor. Then one day I come home. And water is spewing out of my house. <laughs> like, 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 what is it, old, old faithful. <laughs> People coming out their house. Hey, McBride. <laughs> Man, I mean, you know, that's an uh, interesting way to. Not, not a good look. One guy told, said, you know, this is why my last neighborhood had, uh, uh, what do you call those, uh, dues. Neighborhood dues. Make sure that we didn't have these kind of problems. It's like, well, you in East Stokeland now, bruh. <laughs> well, welcome to the problems. <laughs> Get back in your house. Stop talking about you. <laughs> Water spewing everywhere. And, 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 and so, you know, I think I called Brother Bill, you know, because I don't know what to do. Man, I'm a new homeowner, house on the hill. I'm happy, thought I got a discount. Said, turn off the water. Turned off the water. Bill called his plumber. Plumber came out, dug down just a little bit underneath the dirt, and the pipe had broke. And looked at the pipe, and the guy used, according to the plumber, he said, now who would put a pipe like this? on a house like this. And I said, I don't know. I got it on a discount. I'm just happy to be in a house. And what he told me was, McBride, your house is on the hill and it is sliding. He said, you know, all houses slide on hills. So it ain't, you know, it ain't like 
you should be that worried about. Like, what are you talking about, man? I grew up on a house on the hill. My parents, we were in San Francisco. Our hill was like that. Our house wasn't sliding down no hill. Didn't understand it, but guess this is Oakland. Huh. And he said the, the, the builder was supposed to put a brace to stabilize the foundation because the soil is shifting. It's not shifting a lot like you just playing like slip and slide on your house. But he said just a little, I mean, an unnoticeable shift of your foundation will move everything under the ground that you can't see. He said, so you're supposed to have a pipe in there that has a little bit of give in it. So the only way it'll break is if your house slip off the hill. And believe me, if that happens, this little pipe is the least of your concern. <laughs> Touch your name, amen. I said, I agree with that. Now, I got, that sounds like two plus two equals four, praise God. Now, I, I, I said long way to say that now we have to check the foundation of our home regularly. Not because we don't have a foundation, but because our foundation was not built right. If Jesus is our foundation, and we may have learned Jesus in this Western Eurocentric, capitalistic, domination, imperialistic way. It's necessary to just check your foundation regularly. <laughs> uh huh. Why? So we know whoever trusts in the stone, talking about Jesus as a foundation will never have cause to regret it. Jesus being our foundation gives us security that we won't have to regret. We won't have to regret it. And I want to submit to you that there is a gospel running around not just under this president, but many presidents before this, the, the, the history of the church in America has kind of been on the wrong side of a lot of issues related to just being peaceful. Can we just start there? Jesus says he's the prince of peace. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Oh, yeah. No turning back. Except when you do me wrong. <laughs> Though none go with me. Still, I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. Oh, yeah. No turning back. Except when you mess with my money, <laughs> or my honey, or my family or my politics, or my material things, or me. Now, I don't remember all those caveats being in the sinner's prayer. <laughs> Jesus says he's the Prince of Peace. Why can't we as a church be more peaceful? If he is the steward, the Lord of all creation, why can't we steward the world? Why are we so seduced by everybody else's directives except for Jesus? Oscar Romero, the archbishop, before he was assassinated in his own church, preaching, was telling 
the 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 law enforcement and Roman, not Roman, and soldiers, the, the rebels, to stop killing their country men and women. And he told him, he said, you don't have to obey an immoral law. The law of God should always trump the laws of human beings. And then they killed him right in his pulpit. Kind of like when Stephen, you know, was trying to get them to stop persecuting folk. And they killed Stephen. Paul did. Stand right there. Let him kill him. Then God dealt with Paul in the next chapter. Let's <laughs> touch your neighbor, amen. What's my point? My point is our foundation is Jesus. It is a sure foundation. It is a foundation that will never cause us to regret. Make sure... Your foundation is the Jesus of Scripture and the history of our faith, not the modern construction of the empire. And it's an important thing to just keep checking. You don't check it by yourself, though, because all of us, if we check our foundation by ourselves, you don't know enough to check, kind of like me out there checking the foundation of my house. I'm not skilled to do that. I could make some best guesses. But how many know there is safety in the multitude of counsel, of community? We must check our foundation together. What's the first thing, set of questions then that we want you, are you building on a trusted foundation of Jesus or are you building on a foundation that is sandy, watery, or rocky? I, 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 I pulled that because, uh, you know, Jesus was talking about the wise person that built their house on sand, on a rock, a foolish person built their house on sand, water, and, and, and the house collapsed. If your life keeps collapsing, your faith keeps wavering, your purpose keeps failing. Maybe you built your house on the water and the rock, on the sand and not the rock. So ask yourself this week, ask yourself for living for the rest of your life. Lord, may my foundation be sure. So I can withstand the hell that's coming my way. And again, it's coming. <laughs> I don't mean to rain on your parade. Maybe sickness in your body, trouble in your marriage, injustice in the neighborhood, losing your job, can't get a job, can't keep a job, no friends, depression, sickness. But your foundation can hold you if it is built on Jesus. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them Jesus is my foundation. The second thing that you can't forget who you are is that we are under construction. Somebody say under construction. Verse number five says, present yourselves as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary vibrant with life. Now, it's so dope to know that you are not finished yet. In the, the kind of traditional theological, my first one of theology classes, and I like this construction of how our salvation is, is talked about through a historical theological lens. It says that we are justified, sanctified, and glorified. I'm giving you some foundations. You should write this down. Take a picture. I don't know. You may. I don't know. Just in case you forget. Justified. That through the work of Jesus on the cross and the grace extended by God, you are justified by faith in Jesus. That happens once. Hmm? One time. You don't get justified two or three times. Can I get a four or a five, six or a seven? No. Because the justification that Jesus does can last you your not just life, but even into eternity. 
Woo, that's some good justification. That's some surety. That we are justified by faith in Jesus. My life is okay. God has saved me, justified me, made me right. Somebody shout hallelujah about that. Justification. Sanctification. You justified, but you ain't right yet. <laughs> you know, we grew up in a holiness tradition, you know, fourth generation holiness. Pentecostal. Jesus' name. That's even more Pentecostal holiness. Uh, and so, you know, sanctification in our tradition, the way we understood it, that you got saved through the confession of your faith. And then there was a second work of grace. Sanctification. That God is now spending the rest of your life sanctifying you. Purifying you. Taking all those things that are not like God and kind of teasing it out. Because, you know, if God just took everything out of your life that was not like God, there'd be nothing left. Praise God. <laughs> you just be walking around here like a skeleton. Broke down skeleton. Just, just, just. So God, you know, take a little, then in its place, give you some more grace. Take a little, then give you some more peace. Take a little, give you some more love. And that happens for the rest of your life. Sanctification. Somebody, I thank God for some sanctification. Justification happens once. Sanctification happens the rest of your life. Then glorification. It's the brusia, the second coming of Jesus. When Jesus comes and restores everything back to its original intent. According to the will of the Father. New heaven, new earth. Everything is made right and we are glorified. It is sealed. It is done. We are then presented it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, when the Son of God appears, we will be like him. Glorification. That happens in the future. Ain't that cool how, you know, systematic theology it always buttons everything up real nice. Then you have practical theology that kind of <laughs> exposes the messiness. But it's okay. That's why all of it is a part of a conversation. But for this purpose, justification once, sanctification the rest of your life, glorification in the future. You and I are under construction because right now, every day, we are being sanctified. We are being transformed to the image of God. It's like you're an ice sculpture and God every day, you know, when he gets done working on me, he moves to you with the chisel. <laughs> Brian, you're a piece of work. I got to move on to somebody else. <laughs> I'm all powerful, but that's enough for you today. Amen. He moves on to the next person and the next person. And for the rest of your life, God is taking and adding, taking and adding. Taking and adding, taking and adding, sanctification. And some of us don't appreciate the kind of construction project that God is doing in our lives. So we feel like we should just be arrived today, or we think we have arrived today, or we think our brother and sister and loved one should arrive today. And so if they don't arrive at the speed we want them to arrive to, or even if I don't arrive at the speed I want to arrive, then I get bogged down in guilt and shame, and I halt the construction of God. Don't you know that, you know, it seems like if there's one thing that Jesus can't work past, it's unbelief. Jesus said it. I could have did many acts. But y'all don't believe, so I got to keep it moving. I'm coming back because I'm going to make a believer out of you. A life will. You're going to holler Jesus in there. You're going to be so low that I got to convince you of anything. Because you know, when you're drowning, you don't be asking if the person trying to save you can save you. 
Ain't that something? You drop. Boop, boop, boop. You not? Can you save me? Can no? You just like save me? No questions asked. You don't ask their color. You don't ask their their background, their religion. You don't ask what they have for dinner. You don't ask how they qualified. When you're drowning, you just reaching up for a savior. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and tell him I'm reaching right now. I'm reaching. And the problem with too many of us is we don't really want to be saved. We want to be comforted. We want to be uh, medicated. We want to be what's numbed. We want to be in a fantasy. Mm-mm. Ain't nothing fantastical or ain't no fantasy about you being worked on. It's the most realest thing that God can do in your life is to work on you. Do I have a witness in here, amen? I mean, when God ain't working on me, then I feel like everything is just, whoo, man, everything's great. Then God starts to taking that chisel out, chiseling away my hatred. My unforgiveness, my violence, my racism, sexism, misogyny, patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia, greed. God start breaking that stuff away. I'm like, ha, stop, God, I've had enough. Go work on them. Stop working on me. I've had enough, God. It's too much. Anybody ever had that? Todd said that to God? Maybe not out loud. You're like, God, I wish you stopped loving me so much today. Just be a little indifferent today. Let me be. And it's so important for you and I to appreciate that this kind of under construction, it should make you and I just much more embracing of other people who are under construction too. That's why we should never glory in the pain and death and suffering of anyone. Why would you be happy about their death? I had, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck a little bit on this transphobia piece this week because there was this big controversy on Breakfast Club. Y'all may not know about Breakfast Club. It's one of these hip hop programs. And, and, and this guy, you know, was on there laughing about uh, this, this very nice looking, uh, 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 she appears to be a woman, black woman. She's transgender. Her name is Janet Mock. And, and, he, and he said, if you were in a relationship with her and you found out that she was really, quote, unquote, a man, what would you do? He said, I have to kill her. And, and you know, there was a time where that probably would have been my flippant answer, too. Right? Because you just kind of shaped it. You know, that response is kind of protecting at least my manhood or something. It's protecting something about me so I don't become... My thing, my life and, and sexuality and my strength don't become questionable, or I've just been taught that it's just so nasty and 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 and, and violated that I must harm you. But after Ferguson, when I started to see and learn how black trans women are being killed at the highest rate we've ever known, and not just killed mutilated, like chopped, like with knives. And I, I had to start to check my own transphobia because I don't want to contribute to an environment where people think it's all right to take someone's life, even if I have been deceived, if that's kind of the story I want to stick to. And so this whole week has been difficult talking to some of my friends who are preachers and others. And, you know, folks, folks look at my post sometimes and then they come like Nicodemus in the night. Like, Brian, you grew up Pentecostal holiness apostolic, right? Like, yeah, I did. I'm reading your post, man. It just don't. You all right? 
said, I mean, I think I'm all right, because I don't want to create a context for people to be killed. You cannot agree with people and at the same time advocate that they do not do harm. That's the at least least place, minimum place, I hope every church in America can get to. Because what do we, do we all agree on everything? Again, I'm holiness, Pentecostal, apostolic. My dad and all them, they raised us, you know, in, in, in the apostolic Pentecost tradition where, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity and baptism was kind of different than some other folks. And, you know, we was all, we, we didn't go out and kill Trinitarians. <laughs> you don't baptize in Jesus' name. So I got a pistol for you. I got a hot one. <laughs> you don't speak in tongues. <laughs> Ain't that something? How we can pick and choose the things that will drive us to harm one another. And this is why it's so important to just appreciate, and I'm going to have to pick this all up next week because our time is going, we need to do communion. That because we're under construction, that you and I must always remember that God, through sanctification, is saving us, both our soul and our body. And that is one of the foundations of the way. We are not just going to be up here talking about your soul and not mention your body. The human conditions that war against your soul come through your body. Even Jesus, when Jesus came to save the world, Jesus didn't come as a spirit. Ain't that something? Even though there was some early the, you know, theology that said Jesus appeared to be human. He was just a spirit. Kind of like Casper, just floating around. That was a, I'm serious, that was a early, so I'm, I'm telling you the truth. It was an early theological, it's either Gnosticism or Docetism. I can't remember which one of the isms it was. Jesus, he appeared to be human, but he was just a spirit. Because they did not believe this particular theory that flesh was good and could be redeemed. So if that's the case, Jesus cannot then be human. He had to even appear to be human. Ain't that somehow your presupposition can lock out the mystery of the gospel? Well, if, if, if Jesus was human, then that means that the flesh contaminated him, so he could not have been human. So now I'm going to make up another thing. He's going to be spirit. <laughs> it's just like, what? Jesus said, touch me. Handle me. It wasn't like, you know, you try to touch Jesus and you go through him like that. And you, like, see this? <laughs> That's not how the thing worked. Jesus was human. Why? Because Jesus wanted to remind all of us that everything God creates is good. It's good. You may not like it, but it don't not make it good. I don't like my vegetables. My mama, I'm, then I'm done. I was watching my daughter, I think it was Sarai, eating these vegetables. Then all of a sudden, she's finished. Daddy, can I be finished? I mean, you know, you ain't got nothing else on your plate. Cool. Runs to the bathroom. So, you know, I've seen this before. <laughs> because I've done this before. I don't know if my parents tell her stories when they go over to their house, which may need to be investigated. We need to find some other babysitters, praise God. <laughs> My daughter had a napkin. Put all her vegetables in the napkin. Put the napkin in her pocket. Daddy cannot be finished. 
Now, if she just would have walked out smooth and cool, it would not have triggered anything. But because I done been there before. <laughs> but something's fishy. She throwing away the best part of her meal because she don't like it. Just because you don't like it don't mean it ain't good for you. So you and I have to be willing. We have to be willing to stay in the process of our construction. Oh, Jesus, help me to remain under construction. Help me not to put a sign up, say, temporary halt. No, do not cross. But let me be open, God. And let me realize that some of these things that you want to take away, tear away from me, whew, I may not know how badly I need to let it go until it's already gone. But it will make my foundation more sure. It will help me move further along in the process of sanctification so I can reach glorification. God knows it'll help me and you be a better witness of the life-saving gospel of Jesus in a world who worships an idol and calls it Jesus. May the church, may we, Hold sure to this foundation. And may we also bear witness to the truth. This Jesus is the one who came to save the world from their sins. Not just your personal sins, but our social sins, our structural sins, anything that tears away at the image of the glory of God. In us and in the world. Let's stand to our feet, everyone. And grab the hand of someone next to you if you. If you believe, hallelujah. Jesus is our foundation. And he's at the center of it all. He is the one who holds us and keeps us. <clears throat> he is the one who is our hiding place and our safe refuge. A treasure. The one who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask or think. Then ask this God, the Savior of your soul, to touch your neighbor that you're touching right now. Only God knows really the things that concern them, and only God can really handle it. But you the persons you're touching are standing in a place where God has always promised to show up. So ask God to show up in their life right now. Ask God to meet their need. Ask God to forgive their sins. Ask God to stabilize their mind and their heart and their soul. Ask God to defeat the enemy in their life. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that you would be our foundation. May we not build on another foundation, a foundation of our race, a foundation of our wealth, a foundation of our national origin, a foundation of our career, of our job, 
God, may we build on you, the foundation. And may your foundation, God, help be the measuring stick, the plumb line, as the prophet says. Justice and righteousness that we measure ourselves against. And so, God, I pray that you will bless my loved one who I'm touching today. I pray that you'll beat the enemy back in their mind. Give them some space so they can inspect the foundation anew. And even as we participate in the Eucharist, the communion celebration, let it also be an opportunity for us to be reminded of the great sacrifice that is indeed the foundation of our faith. Oh, thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for giving us life and life everlasting. Now lift those hands right where you stand and ask the Lord to bless you in the unique ways that you need the blessing. It's me, oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister. It is not my brother. It's not my loved one, but it is me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need your strength and I need your power. I need your forgiveness. I need your help. I need your holiness to sustain and strengthen me in this moment and this time that I'm in. Touch my body and heal me. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. Touch my soul and save me. Somebody say, save me, Lord. Touch my mind and deliver me. Somebody say, deliver me, Lord. Touch my life and transform me. Somebody say, transform me, Lord. Do it in the name of Jesus. Break these yokes of sin. These yokes of bondage that will cause us to be deceived and led astray. Help us, God, to be people who can embrace your transformative work in our lives. And Lord, we'll say thank you. We'll give your name the glory. And we'll give your name the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.